All right, here we go. We got one of the newest stars from Dallas, Texas. Little Loaded is in the building. Appreciate you for having me. Black baby here. Of course, man. Of course. Uh, man, I'm looking through this catalog. Uh, man, Gang Unit got 10 million views on YouTube. Black Baby got 9 million. Back on the Block got two. Ops on Fire got two. Out of My Body got two. Smoke Today got two. Like, you know, that's not even counting all the Spotify and Apple Music and everything else like that. You got tens of millions of people that are checking for you right now. Yeah, it feel good. It's it's real. It's humbling too. I bet. I bet cuz you got a really interesting story. So, you know, this is your first time here, so I want to get into the whole thing. So, you're actually born in Cali. Yes. What part? I was born in San Bernardino. Okay. Okay. And then you moved to Dallas when? When I was like 10. Okay. So, you grew up in Dallas since you were like in elementary school pretty much. Yeah. But I still go back to California and go home. Okay. So what was it like in Dallas as a, as a 10, 11, 12-year-old? It's just like, I mean, it's like anywhere in the city, you know what I'm saying? But you, you see different stuff. You, ch- you just, I guess you kind of grow up a little bit faster, I would say, in Dallas. Okay. And were both your parents in the house, one parent? No, my mom. Where was your dad during this time? Uh, locked up. Okay. Can you say for what? Nah. Okay. So I know you had an older brother. Did you have any other siblings? Yeah, I got a little sister, a big sister, and a little brother. Okay. So it's a pretty big family. So there was like five of you all together. Uh huh. But you had an older brother, and how older? How much older was he than you? Eight years. Okay, quite a bit. Quite a bit. And I guess you guys used to talk a lot about. You yeah, know, my he's big brother about how to make money and everything else yeah, like that. My big brother pretty much raised me. Okay. So here you have this guy who you look up to, who's pretty much raising you, but he's kind of mixed up in the streets himself. Yeah. Did you know of anything that he was doing, or were you just too young? No, yeah, I knew. Okay. So when you were fifteen years old, something happened. Yeah. Can you talk about that? Yeah, when I was 15, my big brother got killed. Do you know what the situation was? No. Okay. Do you remember getting that call? Yeah. How'd you feel when you got that phone call? Really, I thought it was going I thought I thought they was going to tell me my mama had died. Like cuz my mama was stressing. I wasn't even living like I wasn't even in Dallas. I was like in Arizona and California because things were, you know, I was getting in the streets and my mama, she was trying to, you know, help me out. But uh, when I got the call, I wasn't even in Texas. So it kind of, it messed with me because I know, like, if I was there, it probably could have been something different. Did they ever find the guys that they killed him? I don't know. Okay, but nobody got arrested, no one got convicted, nothing. mm did that bother you? Nah. Why is that? It just didn't. Okay. Did you cry when you first heard the news? Most definitely. How did your mother take it? It that that do something different to a mama, cause no no parent think they gonna have to bury their child. They always see their child burying them. So you know it take a it take a big toll on her. So really, my my crying was delayed. I, I cried the first day. And then we drove out there the next day, and I ain't cry for a long time, like, like two years. And after two years, you start crying again? Yeah. Why was that? Like, what, what triggered that? Just, I don't know. It's just like certain times t- t- stuff get heavier. Stuff get heavier. I mean, how hard was that funeral? Yeah, it was tough. Real tough. You know, all my family came from California. Everybody around, you know, like it. It was it was hard, but at the same time, I always I ain't do no crying at the funeral and stuff because I was I would feel like I had to be solid for my mama and my siblings. Like I'm the my big brother was I, the man of the house, so shit. Now it's up to me, so I handle business. Right. So you were 15. So he was 23 at the time. Yeah. 
man, that is so young. I mean, I know because you're 19 right now. Yeah. Like, let me tell you, I'm I'm in my 40s, and, and 23 is just you're just getting started. You got way more living to do. You got way more, you know, uh, experiences to have. Like, you really have not lived life yet at 23. That, that's really sad, man. Yeah. Seeing your brother pass away like that from from street violence. Did you feel like I got to get away from all this or did you make it, did you kind of feel like you needed to go harder? No, nah, I really ain't gonna lie to you. Turn me up. Made me feel like ain't nobody care about my brother and how, how we felt about him. So she, it is what it is. Okay, so then you started getting mixed up in the streets yourself. Yeah, I was already kind of in the streets, but that, yeah, I kind of put, put me here first. You talked about, I think it was uh, in the Genius interview, that you had been shot at a bunch of times. Yeah. Like, how old were you when you first got shot at? Probably about 15, 15, yeah. Okay. When you first got shot at, uh, how did that affect you? I mean, for me, I always been a thinker, so like, I always knew it, it would come with it. Shit. Okay, well, getting shot at is one thing, but then at one point you actually got shot, I think, in the hand. Yeah. Can you talk about that situation at all? Nah. Okay, but from what you said in an interview, that you actually put your hand up to your face. Yeah. And you got shot in the hand. So if your hand wasn't there, you would have gotten shot in the face. Yeah. Uh, most people would just say, "All right, I'm I'm just gonna move. Like this is this is getting too crazy." Because you were literally a, an inch away from, you know, getting killed potentially, right? Mm -hmm. So you had a near death experience. Did anything change after that? Just the way I move, move smarter, so I don't get put in that situation again. You feel me? So like. I just move right. Do you feel like you got caught slipping that day? Yeah, for sure. All right. And you talked about how you became paranoid afterwards. Yeah, it kind of made me more more alert. Got to pay attention to everything. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, I interviewed this guy, Shaka Senghor. He, uh, he had a situation in Detroit where uh, somebody shot him. Uh, in a trap house, and then he just got so paranoid that he started carrying a gun everywhere, and then he had a, a situation where a drug deal started to kind of go sideways, and he ended up pulling out and killing the dude, and then he ended up spending, you know, like 20 years in prison uh, over that. He ended up writing a best-selling book <laughs> about about his situation, which, you know, and he was on Oprah's show and everything else like that, but, you know, he talked about how after he got shot, he was really traumatized. And how, let's just say a white kid in the suburbs gets shot. He gets a bunch of counseling and he goes to see a therapist and they talk about what he went through. But most black kids, they get shot, they patch him up and they throw him right back in the same neighborhood with the people who shot him. Is that pretty much what happened to you? Yeah, it'd be like, I mean, I didn't even go to the hospital when I got shot. So like, that, me, I feel like shit, me, yeah, that, that's my choice. Like, I know what I'm doing. Nigga ain't, nigga ain't no goofy, nothing like that. You know what I'm saying? Why didn't you go to the hospital? Because stuff come when you come when you got to go to the hospital for stuff like that. All right, because they got to report a shooting. Yeah. Okay, but how, how bad was the injury? It didn't, the bullet didn't even go through my hand. Like, it didn't come out the back. Oh, it didn't come out the back? No. -uh. So you still have a bullet in you? No, it got stuck. It got took out. Like, it's certain people in the hood you can trust you can go to and shit. Wait, wait, wait. I've never even heard about this before. Okay. So you're telling me you went to, like, a hood doctor to take the bullet out? Yeah. My partner and mom. Okay. Did she, like, numb the whole area or whatever? Or did she have to pull the bullet out while you're still feeling everything? Tough situation. <laughs> Yo, that sounds crazy. I've never heard about this before. Because usually anything like that, there's a bunch of anesthesia, so you don't feel anything. 
So you're saying she, someone took a bullet out of your hand with no anesthesia? Yes, sir. How old were you? About 17 at that time. 18. Yo, I was 18. 18, and they're pulling a bullet out of your hand. I'm sure there's blood everywhere. Uh, are you screaming <laughs> like during this whole process? Honestly, I don't really even remember the whole thing. Honestly. Nigga was f fucked up. Okay. Uh, so now, now you get shot. They patch you up, and you're right back in the streets again. Uh, you talked about a game called Gun Mayhem. Yeah. What is that? It's just like a, I think it's like a computer game, and they call they call it Glocks because you can't you know it's a trademark you can't use the name they call them Glicks on there. So. Mm. Okay, and, and you 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 have a thing for Glocks. Yeah. What is it about the Glock that you like over other guns? It's reliable. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Doesn't jam that much. Okay, so at what point did the rapping start? Uh, last year. Black Baby was my second song. So about uh, a month, maybe two months before Black Baby, I put out my first song. And how'd you come up with the name Little Loaded? Everybody always called me that. Okay. So you started rapping about a year ago. You, you put out your first song. What was the name of the first song? Uh, B.O.S. Okay. You put it out on YouTube? Yeah. Did it do anything? Yeah. It did pretty decent, I think, as a matter of fact. Like, for a first song, yeah. Okay, like how many views did it get before before Black Baby came out? Probably like 500, 600 views in a month. Okay, so you're not even breaking 1,000 yet. You're just starting out. Yeah. Okay. So then you put together Black Baby. And I guess you got the, the beat off of YouTube. Yeah. Okay. So how did you search for that beat? I just put in some NLE chopper beats, and that one came up, and it didn't sound like a chopper beat to me. And I really, I liked it. The melody that it had in it, like behind the bass, it really made it. Yeah, no, that, that piano riff on there is, is, is dope. Yeah. You know, but but it's also like, like when you listen to it, you're like, all right, like, it's still kind of very sparse, so there's a lot that you could do on it. It's not like an obviously like a superstar beat. Yeah, a lot of work had to be done to turn that into a hot song. So, so you heard that beat, and then you went to go record it. Yeah. When you finished, did you feel like you had something on your hands or, or not? Yeah, because right? I freestyle everything. All my songs, I freestyle. I did that in two takes. I finished that in two takes. The engineer and and dude I was smoking with in there, he. They was going crazy, like before he even finished mixing it. So I was like, I might got some. Took it to the hood, played it for everybody in the hood. Everybody like, you going, you snapping like this would be, this would be big if you could push it. So I kind of okay. Like, so you, so you put it together, then you shot the music video. Yeah. All right. That was in your neighborhood. Yeah, that was that was right down the street from where I stay at. But yeah, it's okay. part of the, yeah. Okay, and then this is where it kind of gets interesting. You put the music video on YouTube, and this Polish YouTuber named Tommy Craze did a video where he he took a bunch of videos that had zero views. Yeah. And he reviewed it. And one of those videos was yours. Tommy Craze reviews the video. In the next couple of days, how many views is the video getting? Uh, uh that morning when I woke up, it was at like. 40, 45,000. And at, by the end of the day, it was at like 150,000. So you went from not, not hitting 1,000 on your first video to hitting over 100,000 on your second one. Yeah. How did that feel? It was ridiculous. But like it all happened so fast, I didn't even really get to soak it up. I still haven't really soaked it up because the next morning when I woke up, by the, by that night, I had uh, I had been contacted by labels and stuff, and then the next the next day I flew out. The next morning, I flew out to Florida to go meet my managers. It happened that fast. Yeah. But by in twenty four hours, labels started calling, 
And then what, a, a manager approached you as well? Yeah, my manager, yeah. Yo, like, like how, did, how did that feel? It was crazy to me. I ain't gonna lie. It was ridiculous. I was like, damn. Like, I ain't never, I ain't expected to be like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, it's... I, I've never really heard a story like this before. I mean, I've interviewed thousands of people. I, I've never, I've never heard this. Like, you know, you hear like the TikTok video or the Vine video or the... You know, someone does a skit around your shit, but someone taking a video with zero views and that song becoming a hit and it's currently at 9 million views it is really something just kind of different, special. I feel like it's because I'm black, baby. They can feel the rawness and the, and the genuineness and the energy and my whole energy. Like, that's me. You feel me? And uh, that's me. And people can feel that. I mean, it's a great song. I mean, I've been listening to it all morning. Appreciate it. Yeah, and it's interesting how it just kind of stops at the end. A lot of times people let the beat ride out, but you decided just to stop it like at two, like two minutes and some change. Yeah. But why is that? That's just me. I feel like it's done. I just snapped. There it go. Okay, and then then there's the music video, which really kind of puts you in, in, in your environment. Yeah. Well, number one, you had a you had a chain on with a star David. Yeah, I love is star David. Is there a significance behind that? I love the star David. Because to me, to me, it just represents strength, strength and unity. That's what I get from it. That's why I, I love it so much. People mistook it and thought I was a, I was a GD or I was banging under the six point star. I had to clear that. No, I just love what it stands for. Well, right. Well, Star David is used by Jews. Mm -hmm. And you that's know, really where I. By, that's by really where I get Israelites. The, that's where I get the strength and unity part from. Yeah. Okay. Now, in the song, you say, real ass crip, I'll never be slime. Yeah. And you talked about, I think in the Genius uh, interview, you talked about how you were rolling 60s. Yeah. Now, I I've interviewed Big U before. Uh, did you ever watch that interview? No. Okay. You know who that is? B Big U is one of the, the main guys in the, in the rolling 60s in L.A. Uh-huh. I don't want to be quoted on this, but somewhere... Around about seventy, about about probably about seventy three, about seventy one, seventy two, they started letting people form their own gangs, and it's like you kind of had to get permission to start your own crip fraction, and that's where the homies went to try to do their own crip fraction, and that birthed the sixties, and that came about seventy three, seventy four. And, and the rolling sixties in L.A. is the biggest gang in L.A. Period. Yeah. It consists of thousands, thousands of members. Yeah. Uh, hoods like in different army, places. It's like an army brigade is what they compare it to. Yeah. How, how did the rolling 60s end up in Dallas? People travel and move around. And when people move, you know, they set up hoods in different areas, you know. That, that's okay. how it really got across the country. All, you know what I'm saying? California, the motherland. Right, because you got Grape Street out in Dallas and mm -hmm. a bunch of a bunch of other uh, L.A. cliques. Okay, but you know, once you start claiming something, then whoever has issues with that clique suddenly, you kind of inherit all those beefs and everything else like that, uh, and that just kind of happens overnight. Because you know, if someone asks, if you're not affiliated with anything, when they say where you're from, you say I'm from nowhere. That's it. Most people just give you a pass and you keep on going. But if you say I'm rolling 60s or I'm Grape Street or I'm whatever, if that person has a problem with it, now now there's a situation. Uh, how did you handle that? That come with it. You feel me? That come with it. And I got show so much love and, and loyalty, so I get that same love and loyalty back. And that's for any 60s, not just 60s from Dallas, 60s from wherever. If you 60s, you show love. That same loyalty you get, from your, you show that to all 60s. Nipsey Hussle was a rolling 60. Yeah. You know, and, and unfortunately, uh, Shitty Cuz was as well. You know, the, the guy who killed him. Uh, when you heard about that situation, being that you claimed that, that, same, that same crew, how did you feel? I feel like, you know, things happen. People ain't always, some people hateful, some people deceitful, you, you feel me? Things happen. But regardless of all that, Nipsey legacy still live on. Great music, huge inspiration. Yeah, I mean, I got to interview him. 
Now, now is the Roma Sosis the, the biggest number of people? Like, you know, in terms of like just sheer numbers, is the Roma Sosis kind of the biggest gang in LA? It's one of the biggest gangs, one of the biggest crib gangs. Okay. You know what I'm saying? And uh, it's one of the most dominant and one of the most like historically like respected areas. And, uh, you know, we've had a few conversations. It's sad, man, especially in LA when, when that hit. It just was like a, a bomb hit. Yeah. LA, he, man, it was just, it was sad. Dipsy inspired a lot of people. So you drop that song and then the labels are calling. Uh, well, you, you got a manager and the labels start calling. What labels were really trying to sign you at that point? Every label. Every label. Yeah. So then you start dropping more videos. Mm -hmm. uh, Out My Body. Yeah, that's one of my more recent ones. Uh, Smoke Today. Yeah, that came right after Black Baby. Oh, that, that was the second, the third one, I guess? Uh, yeah. Okay. And, and in that video, like in the very beginning, you like pulled out some paperwork and you just said, just, just post a bond. And then you drop Gang Unit. Yeah. And, and that song actually did better than Block Baby. Yeah. Okay, like how long after Block Baby did Gang Unit come out? Um, I think Gang Unit was the song right after Smoke Today. So probably a song in between. Okay, why do you think that song reacted so much? Because it's the, the, the energy and the feel. Like, dance to this bitch if you gang, bang. Like, turn up with me. It don't matter what you bang, like. You living like that, that's your lifestyle. We all we all do what we do, you feel me? We can all chill together and dance, turn up. Okay. Well, here you are in Dallas and you're dropping song after song after song, and all these songs are getting millions of views. Like, you know, back, like I said, back in the block is two million, ops on fire is two million. Are you still living in the same neighborhood? No, I'm not still living in the same neighborhood. I still be in the same neighborhood. I'm in Dallas. I'm there every day. Okay, but you moved away. Yeah, you can't, you can't, you can't, you can't live in the same hood where like and be known. You know what I'm saying? Okay. So, what started to happen when Little Loaded, the the you know the local kid that everybody knows, suddenly is Little Loaded, the rap star who's getting millions of views and is starting to be known all over the country? Like, did you feel like jealousy started started to occur in your neighborhood? Yeah, certain people start acting real funny. You know, certain people start looking for stuff that they didn't deserve, you feel me? So with that come a lot of a lot of tension and different stuff like that. So just try, you just keep your head on straight and keep making music. That's what I focus on. Keep making good music at the end of the day. Right, because there was a situation, I think it was December 19th, where you got into a fight uh, in a sneaker store. Was that in Dallas? No. Okay. Can you say what that was over? No. Nah. Okay. But it just kind of goes to show how there's just, you get more haters along with the success. Most definitely. Okay. Uh, so you started dropping more songs and then you started touring around. Uh, what, what really started to change in your life as the as the music success started happening, money and the amount of resources I got, I still live the same way. Like my like I know they like when I'm with my managers and stuff, they like to eat out and stuff. I eat a bag of chips and a sandwich. Like that's what I like. That's what I'm used to. You feel me? I still live the same exact way. When I'm in Dallas, I'm still in the hood. I still do anything out anything else I would do. I move smarter and more. You know what I'm saying? But I don't, I don't, I don't change the way I live. That's why I keep. That's why I feel like I can consistently make the same type of music, same good music, because I'm not, I'm not trying to change my whole lifestyle. I still wear, I still wear clothes that I like. I'm not trying to be dripped down in designer. You feel me? I'm just a genuine person. But yeah, once you get some more money, you're gonna start playing around some designer shit. Nah. -uh. Never. Like I wear designer. I wear designer. Money, you know what I'm saying? Money not the problem. Income great, but I just I wear what I like, and a lot of designer stuff I just don't like. That's not my style. You feel me? I feel you. And 
you know, Dallas is kind of becoming an interesting place because I feel like like Dallas is really blowing up. Yeah, most definitely. Well, because, you know, historically in hip hop, Houston has always been yeah. the, the, the city in Texas that all the big rappers are coming out of. Yeah. And then Dallas had this long stretch where really there was nobody coming out of Dallas for like 10, 15 years, mm-hmm. right? And then, you know, I mean, number one, you got Post Malone. Yeah, most definitely. Who's, who's the A biggest guy. artist, period, in the world. Post Malone, Post Malone is that guy. People forget he's from Dallas. Yeah. People don't really recognize it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, because he's not really a rapper, but yeah. like- But he's hard, I mean, he's, for sure. He, he hard. I mean, he's a megastar. Yeah, for sure. And and he puts a lot of rappers on his shit, if you notice. Like the 21 Savages and yeah. everything else like that. He don't, he don't have to do that. He, yeah. he could be he a hard. superstar on his own. Okay. Then you got Yellow Beezy. Most definitely. Uh, you got Asian Doll. You got Mo3. Uh, you got a bunch of dudes. Trap Boy Freddy. Trap Boy Freddy, yeah. I mean, most of these people I've interviewed, except for Post Malone. 10K Cash. Yeah, I mean, there's a spotlight on Dallas right now. Yeah. How does that feel? Are you actually working with some of these other artists that I mentioned? We'll see in the future. (laughs) We'll see in the future. Um, How did your family react once things started changing for you? Everybody just really supported. You know, you got some family members that... You know, you know, you, everybody got them family members that, that try to act fake after. Then you got some that's really supportive, you know, just take it in stride. You got to learn how to deal with each with each different scenario. Oh, yeah, man. I know. I hear these stories where, like, someone will be like, yeah, my aunt used to tell me, like, oh, you know, keep going. And then once once they blew up, you'd be like, remember you told me to go get me that $250,000 condo? And it's like, I'm supposed to give you a condo for telling me to keep going? Like, <laughs> well, what's next for you? More work. More work. Trying to focus on getting to the next level. That's what it really is for me. I'm, I'm real, like, I'm real. I try to challenge myself, like, I think I like I move life like kind of like a game. I try to get to the next level. I want to move fast though, so I be I do whatever I can. I take risks. You know what I'm saying? So I'm trying to go. I'm trying to get bigger and bigger. I just want and do everything my way. I don't want to. You know, I want to have fun. Do it the Black Baby way. Right, because you dropped the the mixtape Black Baby. Yeah. In uh, in 2019, had a you know most of the songs I was talking about was actually on that mixtape. It's got 11 songs. When did that drop? Or what month? Um, December. Okay. So it j- just dropped a few months ago. Do you have another mixtape coming out? Most definitely. Okay. What's the name of it? A Demon in Blue. A Demon in Blue. <laughs> okay. Uh, and that's kind of self-explanatory. Uh, any features on it? We'll have to see. We'll have to see. Okay. Are you still getting your beats off of uh, YouTube, or are you actually working with? I'm working with producers, producers now. mainly now, but I still do get beats from YouTube, uh, and producers em- email me beats. I get beats from anybody. It person could DM me on Instagram if I like the beat, I like it. Just, I mean, yeah. If you think about the biggest song of last year, which is Old Town Road, he got that beat in the exact same way that you got your Black Baby beat. He got it off of YouTube. I mean, it's just like all the rules are changing now, you know, like like the new the new generation of, you know, the the two thousand babies, are really kind of just changing the rules of music and creating huge hits off of a beat off of YouTube. Yeah, everything got to evolve. Doing things your way, people gonna make mistakes, and other people are gonna use their mistakes and do things kind of the way they did it and change stuff up. So. Everything's going to keep progressing. You feel me? Yeah. Well, listen, man. Uh, congrats on your success. Uh, Thank you. Because getting an opportunity like you got where you had someone review your video and the song blew up, that could have been your only song. But you actually took that opportunity and dropped more music and, and actually dropped a song that was bigger than that song. Yeah. And ran with it and got a deal, allegedly, (laughs) or maybe not. Got a manager 
and you're out doing promo runs and you're getting uh, paid shows. And uh, that's dope, man. Not a lot of people could pull that off because a lot of people get lucky. Everyone gets lucky at some point in their lives. Yeah. Everybody. Most definitely. But there's a difference between luck and skill. And I think what we're seeing right now is is a skilled artist that's really pushing the limit right now. Thank you. And it's the hard, I feel like it's the hard work. And me not feeling like, oh, I just got a hit. Let me, nah, it's, it's time to keep going. Keep going with it. It's not one person that's a legend in the game that got one good hit. I don't care who who you can say. It's not one that just got one good hit. You got to keep working. And that's how oh, I feel yeah. about it. Yeah, man. You can't think about all the shit you did in the past. You got no. to plan for the future. And but great listen, managers. Uh, Lil Loaded, appreciate you coming in. And I wish you the best. Thank you. Appreciate no it. No doubt, man. Till next time. All right. Peace.